Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have to confess it's hard to talk after having seen tumors for a few minutes <laughs> and blood. <laughs> I'm quite sensitive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, my name is Enrico Bertini, and I am an assistant professor at NYU School of Engineering. I've been there for four years now. And um, in my group, what we do is to study and develop novel visualization methods and systems to help people make sense of and uh, communicate uh, data. Um, the, typically, the, the kind of work that we do is more on how to visualize abstract data rather than physical data, like the one that you have just seen in the previous presentation. Um, so, for instance, some of the work that we do is with um, in healthcare, but rather than having information coming from a MRI scan, we have, um, say, information coming from an electro electronic health records, and there's no clear uh, visual representation for that. So, part of the work that we have to do is to figure out how to visualize this kind of abstract data. Um, so, my talk is mostly about a few reflections that I have collected, uh, thinking about a few projects I've been working uh, throughout the years, working with um, scientists. Um, and scientists are people too, <laughs> okay? So, um, so these are three main big projects I've been working throughout the years. The first one is, um, work that I've done a few years back when I was still at the University of Constance in Germany before moving here. And that was uh, in collaboration with a group of people studying drugs. So how to come up with new uh, drugs. And the second one is uh, with a group of uh, climatologists uh, who are mostly interested in comparing different climate models. And uh, the last one that is still active and I just mentioned is uh, about how to help um, doctors and administrators in hospitals figure out um, how to discover important information from electronic health records. Um, so before I do that, I want to briefly mention the typical conversation that I have with scientists when I am describing what I can do for them. And it's not always like that, that's a little bit of a joke, but <laughs> typically it's me very excited coming and saying, we are building an amazing tool for you. You'll be able to navigate multidimensional spaces interactively while computing them with multiple clustering algorithms and then verify everything, building an interactive multi-class classifiers on the fly and blah, 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 right? And the scientist is like, okay, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you draw a picture for my paper? Right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the typical response that I get at the beginning. So scientists believe that the, 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 the main job of a visualization expert is to draw a picture for his or her next paper. And as much as I like doing that, that's not the way I see my job. <laughs> I think we can do a little bit more than that. So. Then the question is, how should or could we, these experts and scientists, work together? And what type of work are they supposed to do together, visualization experts and scientists? So uh, what I want to share is a little bit of how I see um, uh, visualization experts and uh, scientists work together. And the way I see it is mostly through Two, two, two main channels of collaboration. The one is discovery, and the first one is discovery, and the second one is communication. What do I mean by that? I think that visualization can be used as a discovery tool or a, a way to think about problems through data and as a way to communicate information once this information has been generated. And I think most people are familiar with the second one, with communication. So when we talk about visualization in science, I think most people think about communicating scientific information through visualization, which is, of course, very important. And there are lots of exciting projects in this direction. 
So typically, that's what you see. You see visualization being applied to um, scientific communication. But personally, I think we sh it should actually look like this. How do we use visualization to help scientists make remarkable discoveries or at least better understand some problems? I think that's a real big challenge and that's what I'm personally interested in. Um, so how can we help scientists generate ideas while working with data? Lots of data. And um, on purpose, I use the word idea or even questions and not answers because I believe that one of the main um, purposes of visualization for discovery is to actually generate some really good questions and then hopefully find some really good answers to these questions. So I am normally very much inspired by what John Tukey, the famous statistician, said. He's been advocating for what he calls exploratory data analysis, so trying to explore data to better understand uh, what a problem is about and generate new ideas. And in one of his famous papers, he said, finding the question is often more important than finding the answer. And I do believe that visualization can be used to find really, really good questions. And hopefully, also some really good answers. So now I want to talk about the power of questions, going through uh, a few examples coming from my own work. These are... These come from the projects that I mentioned at the beginning. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to give you all the details about these projects. I, I would just gloss over to give you a sense of what kind of projects uh, these were or are. Um, but I want to highlight the idea that there are some really interesting questions behind these projects and the fact that visualization can help um, generate new interesting questions or even try to answer some of these questions. So the first one, comes from the work that I've done with a group of biochemists in Germany. And these people are interested in coming up with new drugs, discovering new drugs. So the way we helped them uh, with visualization was to create visualization systems that allow them to uh, start from one specific drug of interest and then uh, create a map of drugs that are similar to this one and also a map that tells the scientists whether these uh, drugs, um, how active these drugs are, are, are or are predicted uh, to, to be. And what you see in this visualization is one of these drugs, each dot here is one of the drugs in the data set. Uh, that's what we call the neighborhood of the drug. The closer two drugs are, the more similar they are in terms of structure and um, and color conveys, um, color and size convey um, activity and so on. So what um, scientists can do with this kind of tool is basically trying to figure out what are interesting, potentially interesting drugs to um, explore further. The second project is in, was in collaboration with a group of climate scientists. And the problem that they have is that they have lots of simulation about climate, climate, but with many different models, okay? So they, each model changes. Um, so in climate science, there are lots of different models to simulate how climate evolves. And um, for a number of reasons, they do need many different kind of models because some models are more specific for some kind of phenomena. Other models are more specific for other kind of phenomena. But the problem that they have is that they don't know how to compare these models. So they don't know where they differ, when they differ, and for what reason they differ. Oh, sorry. So what we did there was to build a visualization system that allows them to compare these models and trying to understand, as I just said, where they differ, uh, when they differ and hopefully also why they differ and hopefully come up with new questions and ideas on how to generate new models. The last one is an ongoing project that we have with um, um, some uh, medical experts at the NYU Langone School of Medicine. And here what, one problem that they have is trying to understand uh, um, how patients are um, treated when they are admitted in the hospital, okay? So what they have is a data, large data sets, 
and for each patient they record what drugs they are receiving in the first two hours when they get into the hospital. And in this case, the first thing that they want to do is they want to understand uh, if there is a relationship between the drugs that they receive and whether the um, patients are admitted or sent back home and understand whether this process makes sense or not. And again, that's another of those projects that when you show a visualization to a doctor, they will start asking you questions like, oh, why is it that? Why do we give this drug? Why do we send this person home after giving these drugs? And so on. So another of those tools that helps scientists come up with really good questions. So I want to conclude with a few reflections that come from me collaborating with scientists for a number of years. So it's, it's been at least five or six years. I had a number of projects with um, many different kind of scientists in different contexts in different uh, countries, actually. So I'll go quickly through a few of these points. The first one is languages. So what I learned is that the most important thing is to learn how to speak the same language. This takes a very, very long time and it's very, very frustrating. Especially, I have to say, being a computer scientist, working with biologists has been extremely hard for me, trying to understand all the terminology. I don't know if there are any biologists here. I'm sorry, but it's really hard to talk to you. <laughs> uh, the second thing is the idea of creativity in science. So what I would love to see more discussed and, what, and the kind of tools and methods that I would like to see more talking about is how do we help scientists being more creative? How do we create tools that help people generate interesting and important questions? I think that's an important problem. Next one is about observation and being a sort of ethnographer. So what I mean here is that what I notice is that many of the important breakthrough that I had in collaborating with scientists came from me sitting next to the scientists and trying to figure out how they work. And I think that's an aspect that is not very well understood. And, um, and people like me who are trained in engineering are not very well trained in being ethnographers. And I think that's a very important point. Um, then another thing, I think a point of reflection is also the idea of dependence, independence, and interdependence. What I mean here is that right now the kind of models that I see happening is a scientist pairing up with a person like me and trying to do something great together. Okay, So that would be interdependence, right? but it can also be dependence because a scientist depends on me before he or she is able to do something on his or her own. So I'm really interested in the idea of how do we actually make scientists independent from us. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, and then also the idea of understanding environments and ecosystems. So we are people like me, as I said, who are trained in engineering, have a hard time uh, understanding the fact that it's not just a matter of developing tools. We have to understand where these tools live and how they interact with many other issues and problems and processes that happen around a scientist or a group of scientists. And that's another lesson that I learned the hard way. Um, and then, of course, also infrastructures. What I mean here is that when we develop new tools, we have to figure out how to interface our tools with an ecology of existing tools. And that's another interesting and very important problem. And the last one is, yes, we can still help scientists create pretty pictures for their papers. <laughs> I'm very happy to do that if it's needed. So this concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs>